Check, check, check. Can you hear me now? Okay, awesome. Welcome everybody tonight. Welcome everybody tonight. Let me turn this off for the feedback. Okay, there we go. Welcome everybody tonight. Tonight we have an awesome, awesome, awesome guest. I can't say, you know, I can't say but so much. I mean, you know, this person is just awesome. Didn't realize, you know, um, we had so many different connections from the Southwest Philadelphia area. Um, but I can talk about, you know, um, years ago when we first met. But first of all, tonight, welcome to Please Educate All Children Equally. We have peace. And our guest for this evening is Dr. Kamika Royal. Dr. Kamika Royal, she has a Bachelor's of Arts from North Carolina Central University in North Carolina in English Literature, Political Science as her minor. She also has a master's in teaching from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. She also has her PhD from Temple University in Educational Leadership and Policy Studies Department in Urban Education. She is an urban education expert with more than 20 years of experience. Her work focuses on the intersection of race, politics, history, urban school reform, she spent seven years as an urban educational profession in the public schools of Baltimore City and Washington, D.C., teaching, coaching teachers, and helping to lead a charter high school. In 2006, Dr. Royal returned to her hometown of Philadelphia and transitioned to higher education, first by teaching pre-service teachers at Lincoln University of Pennsylvania, then for other colleges and universities in the Philadelphia and Baltimore regions, while she continued to coach and support urban school leaders and teacher educators. In 2014, she returned to Baltimore as an assistant professor of urban education at Loyola University of Maryland. There she helped to launch the School of Education's urban education minor for two years. She led the Center for Innovation in Urban Education. During her tenure, she established the CIUE's first ever community advisory board, secured a partnership with the Baltimore Algebra Project and brought the Free Minds, Free People Conference to Loyola University of Maryland in the summer of 2017. In 2021, Dr. Royal was tenured and promoted to the rank of associate professor. Everybody, I present to you, Dr. Kamiga Royal. Good evening, Doc, how you doing? I'm good, how are you? Like I said before we got began, I'm just blessed, blessed to be here. Glad to be here engaging with you one-on-one. -on -one Thank you for talking having to, me. Talking about this great work, oh, no, no doubt, no doubt. So um, how are things going for you? Uh, I feel like things are going pretty well. You know, I mean, life is life in, but what can I, I'm glad to be on this side of the dirt, so I won't complain. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Before we get in, before we get it started, I have to shout out to somebody in Baltimore, um, Brother Kevin Brown sponsors us tonight, KB Collections. He makes all types of um, bags and, and, and jewelry and, and stuff at the shelters, but it's a big old giant bag he made. He hand makes these crafts here. KB Collections. You can check him out on uh, Facebook and on Instagram. He has a lot of great furniture, bags, shoes. He does it all. KB Collections out of Baltimore. He's a graduate of the HBCU Coppin State and a member of the Omega Psi Pi Fraternity Incorporated. So just putting it out there, giving him his plug. So we're going to get into the book. We are going to get into the book. Tell me right now, wow, um, for those that don't know, who may have been under a rock, <laughs> you know, in education, in urban education. Um, not pay for us, not pay for us, right? Yep. Not pay for us. Explain the entire title and why not pay for us, Black educators and public school reform in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Talk about that for a second. Where does that inspiration come from? So the title of my book, Not Paved for Us, comes from a Maya Angelou poem um, called On Working White Liberals. I discovered this poem uh, when I was a high school student in Philadelphia, um, 27, 27 or so years ago, when I was in the citywide African-American History Month oratorical contest. Um, 
And I used this poem to open up my speech for the, the oratorical contest and I ended up winning. And um, back then DAS was owned by black folks. And so I got to go to Africa as a result of winning for the city because DAS threw that in um, for the, the high school winner. But her poem um, on working white liberals uh, sort of challenges these ideas around um, who liberals have and have not been for Black America. And as I was sitting at 440 collecting data, because the book had a different title um, propped previously, um, but I was reading the minutes of the Board of Education, um, probably, I think it was either in the spring of 2018 or 2019. And I was like, eh, let me go back and look. That for some reason that, that poem came back to my mind. And so I was like, God, this stuff is reminding me of all these people who are allegedly so liberal um, and one of the lines I say in the introduction is with Democrats like these, who needs Republicans, you know? Um, but these people are supposed to be so liberal and yet, uh, you know, the, the city of Philadelphia has been run by liberals or Democrats for so long. And yet, um, you know, what sort of material difference has that made for the masses, um, especially through schools in Philadelphia? That's not something, and I, I studied, you know, 50 years of the district. It's not something I was able to find. Wow. wow. You, you know, when I read the introduction, I was like, whoa, um, I can't wait for the book. I mean, I hit you right away and I was like, this is awesome. Like I was, I, like, as a former educator in Philadelphia, I was like, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. You know, that's just how I was, I was going there. Um, so many gems in here. And as someone from Southwest Philadelphia graduating from Pepper Middle School, you know, and serving as an educator, you know, for 29 years in the Philadelphia area, I felt like, you know, I visualized every bit of what, you know, I've read thus far. And I'm excited to get my autographed copy. Looking forward to that. <laughs> um, so looking forward to when it's coming out. Um, and so I, I met you, you know, when you first, you know, came to our school, I'm gonna say probably around like 2010, that's mm -hmm. right around the time you guys started doing the research or whatever. And, um, you know, it's somewhere around there, 2010, mm -hmm. maybe 2009, somewhere around I, there. I started the research in 2008. I probably okay. didn't circle to you until around 2010. Right, right, right. Okay, cool. And, and that was um that was awesome and amazing. Um, but as someone who went to follow your schools as well, um, talk about educators. Any specific teachers like growing up in the Philadelphia area? You say by name if you want. You know that inspired you or sure. that you to pay homage to. Um, there was a, a counselor at Pepper Middle School, Gail Trent who was also my Sarah. She had a son who was my age. I don't know where Miss Trent is now. I ran into her um, at a Delta event. I think it was the Philadelphia Alumni Prayer Breakfast probably 10 years ago when Reverend Wright, Jeremiah Wright was the speaker. I think I saw Miss Trent um, there. She was a counselor at Pepper and she was, you know, she was wonderful to me and for me. Um, I would... There's a, um, a nice white lady down in Florida, Ms. Carol Ginsburg, who I actually hmm. adore. And I, because I'm a pre-service um, teacher educator and I teach intro to education, um, this semester in one of my classes, 75% of the class, their parents are educators. So they've already been exposed to um, teachers in a different sort of way from you know people who haven't sort of had that. And I mentioned that because they had been talking about their the best teachers they ever had. And, um, and so I was asking them, like, do you ever tell these people how wonderful they were for you? And it reminded me that I had not been in touch with Ms. Ginsburg mm. for years. So I actually looked her up on the internet, found her and gave her a call. And um, her husband was like, Kamika, like, oh my God, you know, we haven't talked to you. I was like, you remember me? He was like, of course. So um, Carol Ginsburg nice. was my 11th grade English teacher at Central High School and, okay. um, and she changed my life. She wow. absolutely changed my life. Wow, shout out to, shout out to Ms. Ginsburg, right? Over yeah. at Central. So Pepper to Central, how'd you make that? Well, of course you had to have the grades and the scores. I know, but you know, it, is that pretty much what it was? Or was some other processes to place to get you there? Or? in love with with central i wanted to go to overbrook actually overbrook had a scholars program did. and my sister was graduating my sister was four years ahead of me in school so when i graduated from pepper in 91 she graduated from overbrook in 91 
She was in okay. the music magnet program at um, Overbrook. Yes. And so I yes. wanted to go into the scholars program at Overbrook. And I yeah. had a friend um, at Pepper, Shonda Johnson. And Shonda and I were both looking at going. Shonda was from West Philly. She's from um, 59th and Chestnut. Um, and we were both going to go to um, Overbrook together. But my parents were insisting that I not go. My parents were very adamant that you know, I, they felt like I had good grades. I was smart. I should, I should take advantage of the opportunities that would be available to me. And at, I think I, I had gotten into Central Girls High and um, Engineering and Science. Mm -hmm. And honestly, they told me no, no to Overbrook. And so I needed to choose from the rest of them. Okay. And I had a hard time choosing. And, and a, a guy who was a friend down the street, the day we had to turn in the papers, he said he put, he picked Central. So I was like, all right, well, I'll, I'll you know, at least I have somebody to ride the bus in the sub with. Yeah, yeah. So that's how I chose that. I didn't know much about it. I was just kind of like, I want to be at all girls school and I want to be an engineer. So I'm trying to recall the year that they actually became co ed because they used to be on all boys, you know, support. 84. Time. 84, 84. Central became co ed. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when I was in school, it was still a boy. So that was class of 83. So after that, sometime after we got that, I do know. Yep. Um, North Carolina is Central. So how did you go from Central here in Philadelphia to North Carolina Central? What's the connection? So I have a very wonderful cousin um, who I adore. She's the first one in my family on my mother's side to go to college. Um, she turned 60 last year. She's the first Sara in my family. She's fall 81. Um, she was very adamant. Like she sort of set all of us on a path of not only will, are y'all going to college like I did, but you're going to an HBCU. Okay. Um, and so she had gone to Central State in Ohio, but then she transferred back home to Westchester. And she used to tell us she wished she hadn't, like she made the best out of coming back home, but she was like, you gotta go away. You gotta go to an HBCU. So her, her sister followed her footsteps and went to Morgan. My sister then went to Shaw University in North Carolina. Um, as you read in the introduction, my father's from North Carolina. And so we right. would go down to North Carolina every year to visit family. So, you know, there's a special place in, in my heart for North Carolina. When it was time to go to college, um, I was looking at HBCUs. I felt like Howard was a little bit closer than I wanted to be. Um, I went to visit Hampton. But the, the recruiter from Spelman had come to Central High School. Mm. And I remember her telling us, if you can go visit these schools, she said, when you step on a campus, you will know if the school is for you. And so when I was a senior in high school and my sister was a senior at Shaw University, she was SGA president. And so my parents and I came down to North Carolina for homecoming at Shaw because it was, you know, my sister's sort of like big event as SGA president. And during that visit, she took us over to NCCU. And we didn't have, we were running late because, you know, you're doing a lot of things. And all we had time to do was like, get out the car. I got out what used to be called the Hoey administration circle. So they've changed it now. The, the young people, this is why one of the reasons I love young people, because the young people down there were like, while wow, you renaming buildings and you taking the, the, the names of racists uh, away from these buildings, we're going to rename. So it's now the James E. Shepard building. Okay. But the Hoey administration circle at the time, we drive in and I remember I get out the car. And I was like, this is it. I don't know what it is. This is it. This is home. This is where I need to be. And um, that's how I picked NCCU. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And so you went to NCCU and, and you majored there in uh, English literature. And uh -huh. uh, yeah, so how, how was that majoring? Did you, know, did you know that going in? That's what you went to major in? Or? Yeah, I kept kind of going back and forth. I had a double major in English and political science. And I was unsure what I really wanted to do. So you got to understand the context, right? So 1995, Carol Mosley Braun was the first Black woman in the U.S. Senate elected in 92. And so I was thinking, I want to I do that. I want to be like a Carol Mosley Braun. I want to follow her. And so I was thinking I was going to go to law school so that I could become a senator. And what gets you to law school? In my mind, English and political science, right? right. But then I, you know, you read more about it and you're like, eh, I don't know that I want to fool with politics in that way. Um, and then I volunteered at a local elementary school and I was working with a child trying to help him read. And um, I, that's when I learned about phonics versus whole language. And I remember kind of being like, I had learned phonics. They were supposed to be teaching whole language, 
but theoretically it just didn't make, I was 18, 17, I think at the time, but it just didn't make sense to me. I was like, he can't sound out, you're supposed to be in a print rich environment, but if you are cash strapped, what's the likelihood that you're in a print rich environment? You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, I get what y'all are saying theoretically, but these kids can't read and you're still operating under the assumption that they're going to be in a print rich environment. And so that's what made me want to be a teacher. And then I was like, okay, maybe, you know, politics sort of is not for me. And so I did this kind of circle back and forth, literature, education, concentration, political science, which way will I go for the four years that I was at NCCU? And so I ended up okay. graduating with a degree in English. Okay. Well, you know, there's, there's politics all in education, as you know now, right? This is plenty as of, I know plenty, now. Plenty, plenty of them. So you're still, yeah. you're still living your purpose regardless, right? You know, Which is that's, funny because I feel like the book brought me back to what I, what I wanted to do very early on. I wanted to, to meld um, this love of education with this concern for politics and this interest in language. Um, and working on this book brought me, brought all those sort of back mm. together. Okay, okay. So let's, let's dig into the book a little bit. I'm pull a few statements out of the book that I read out of the introduction only. All I've seen is the introduction. Like I said, I can't wait to get my full copy. I'm going to sit there and read it. I the can't whole wait thing. to get my full copy. I know, that's right. You were saying <laughs> that. That's crazy to me, but I, I get it. I get it. So the statement examines the racial and cultural politics of school reform on the backs of Black people in a disguised Southern city. Like, I know where you're coming from when you say that, because being a person, you know, just a couple years older than you, and growing up in Philadelphia at a particular time and whatnot, um, I experienced a lot of different things. Set that up, you know, pay homage to anybody where you may have gotten that information from. And set that up for those people who might not know or only know Philadelphia as the city of brotherly love. Sonia Sanchez called Philly a disguised Southern city when she, I want to say it was in her poem about the MOVE event, the MOVE massacre of 1985. Mm -hmm. um, and as someone who loves poetry and language, um, I, I circled, I, I read that I was seven years old when MOVE happened and, and um, I remember when MOVE happened, I remember driving through the neighborhood a few days after because a friend of the family, um, they lived in West Philly, not far from Osage Avenue. And so we used to drive by and see the block. When I got to college, I read this Sonia Sanchez poem about MOVE. And, you know, when you're, I think when you're from a place, you know, I didn't realize it was, it had sparked sort of a nationwide concern. Um, I, I was, I was all, you know, I was a kid. But when I started this research, for some reason, I got back to her poem um, because you're always trying to sort of create or understand the context, make sense of the context. And so I was reading uh, VP Franklin, his um, The Education of Black Philadelphia, which was published in 1979. And um, Michelle uh, Foster, who was writing in the 90s, um, Black Teachers on Teaching, she uh, is a Philadelphian. Um, was I think she's a native Philadelphian. And so she was writing in there about Philly being located in, in a quote unquote border state, mm. you know, what it meant to be so close to the South, you know. Um, and so I just thought Sonia Sanchez's characterization of it as a disguised Southern city. I, I, I sometimes feel like I tell people I'm a great migration joint, you know, like um, I, Yes, collard greens, cornbread, black eyed peas, you know, like that, that my, my family's from North Carolina right. um, and South Carolina for that matter. So, you know, we didn't sort of just pop up in Philly. Most of, I think what is unique about us as, as black Philadelphians are those things we got from, you know, our, our, our foremothers and forefathers who were traveling that great migration path, you know. Sure, sure, sure. Behind. Sure. Shout, shout out to Georgia. I mean, you know, my um, grandmother came from Georgia. A little small town called Tableton, Georgia. Never been there, but I know that's where they came from. It has maybe less than a thousand people these days. Um, education reforms. You know, talk about from your perspective, you know, why they have been done what they were set out to do for Black students academically or holistically. You referenced that in the introduction of the book. It depends on what we believe they were set out to do facts right it depends on whose narrative you believe right um so i was i was finishing my third year of teaching when no child left behind became the law of the land right so and here i was 24 years old and i was supposed to believe george bush 
with his compassionate conservatism was going to usher in a testing system full of um, rewards and harsh, harsh and harsher punishments, right? Because he was going to crack down on people failing black children. I like it, it means you have to believe George Bush cares more about black children than the people in these schools, right? So that I, I think you have to ask intended to do what? One of the things um, that I discovered in my research was this sort of racial capitalism that was operating as a result of a reform like No Child Left Behind. Hmm. So it's using, see, now I feel like I'm giving away too much of what it does. <laughs> it's not, no, it's okay. Well, give, us, just give, us a little, give us a little bit, give us a little bit. It's a reform scheme. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a shell game. So you're telling us, you sell us on, oh, we can't keep failing these children. We can't keep failing these children. So what you going to do to not fail the children? Well, we're going to send y'all a bunch of money. Oh, okay. So now the schools are going to get the resources we, we've been asking for? Well, hold on. The, schools, the school system is actually going to be a funnel for the money. So instead of the money coming from the state going to the schools, the money goes from the state to outside providers. Let's see all the things outside providers can do for the children. Wow. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So for decades and decades, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough money. We state, we need more money. We need more money. And the state's like, no, no, we don't handle money. We don't handle money. We, don't have, we got money if you let us take you over. Now, when you take us over, then it's, well, let me make sure this person gets a contract because they're going to do this for you. Let me make sure this person gets a contract because they're going to get this for you. That is, and you know how that, how that money's how that's set up? That whole narrative around black and brown children are failing, that is racial capitalism. Mm. It is the idea that somebody gets rich off somebody else's identity. Somebody else's problematized identity. And what they did was sell black and brown children as failures, as a way to enrich their homies. Mm, 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 so what do I think about that as reform? I would ask where the where was the mass improvement? Where was the mass uplift? Where is it? Where did it go? Yeah. I, I just know when we we can talk about all different types of strategies and things of that nature and whatnot, some things you know that are you know grassroots based and whatnot, but I do know that relationships relationships matter. You know, having those babies inside the room to connect, like you talked about the teacher Miss Ginsburg. I mean, you had a great, you had an awesome foundation anyway, right? But then that that relationship with Miss Ginsburg took that to another level, even, right? You know, so um, that could be black, brown, white, you know, whatever the teachers are, right? You know, the relationships definitely do matter. Um, yeah. But we're talking about black educators right now, so let's dig a little bit deeper into our black educators, right? Okay. You know, so Black Educator Chronicles. I'm gonna go from your book. Black Educator Chronicles are essential to reformed discourse, but our voices have traditionally been muted too often. Black educators themselves have been treated as passive or tangential peripheral objects rather than agentive subjects of reform. You know, and that right there. And you know, for me personally, as a black man in education. You know, I kind of like, I can relate to that. I can identify, especially that, that peripheral kind of thing. We need black male educators. It's still going on. We need black male educators. Okay, we got these black male educators. Um, you know, but it's almost like when you, once you become, quote unquote, or once you get a position as a black male educator, they want you to, like a better term, in my humble opinion, shut up and dribble, right? Mm -hmm. We got you there. We got this thing, but they want us to shut up and dribble. But for any other brothers and sisters out there, you know, just going through something like that, right? What, what sort of advice or what is your opinion about that, first and foremost? And what, any, any advice you have for those that may be in those spaces? Take a deep breath. I get it. Well, I'm thinking about that, that I I, and I feel like I'm going to misquote him, but that wisdom from Lerone Bennett that says um, in an education system, you're either, either a revolutionary or an oppressor. Mm. Um, and I think that we all have to decide. I think it's a series of decisions. Um, I do think, uh, you know, I, it's a complicated thing to discuss. I feel like in a, in a, um, Social media is a hard place to discuss something like we need more black male educators, right? Or we need more black educators. So I would say we absolutely need more. Yes, 100%, we absolutely do. However, I think we should be careful 
that we don't um, perpetuate ideas of what this means and what it looks like, what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. I, I, we have to be careful that we're not so concerned with the um, surface that we forget about the substance. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sort of swayed by these efforts around um, black male educators where everything, where, where we're preserving um, patriarchy and misogyny, mm. right? Where we reduce what it means to be a black man to learning how to wear a suit and tie a tie, mm. right? These ideas that um, if you, you can teach black people how to behave in such a way that we will be perceived as less than a threat. Right, um, because once what we're doing is then holding up white supremacy culture. Mm. We, we, we are acting as if there. the thing is, we are threats by virtue of the fact that we exist. Absolutely. That we haven't all died, you understand? So <laughs> there is nothing, there's no way that any of us can contort ourselves into something that's gonna make us less of a threat. And I worry about educators sort of upholding these ideas. I understand equipping our young people because we don't want anything to happen to them. But we also, we have to be honest about the context in which we live instead of pretending there's so much we can do to stop these things, um, to our behavior can stop it from happening. Right, right. And a lot of times the narrative becomes, especially for men, for, and first of all, let me say this comment. This is me, this is not Kamika saying this. You know, all skin ain't kin. I'm just gonna say that. All skin ain't kin. You, you know. go ahead and say, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you know, but yeah, we agree. We definitely come from the same cloth on that. All skin ain't kin. So just, you know, my grandmother, you know, may she rest in peace, you know, um, she always used to say, all skin ain't kin. And she would say, everybody should call ain't your kind, right? So it, what do we, what, what does the term even black educator even mean? I mean, you know, we can have a whole other conversation about that. So I struggle for that with electoral politics. Right. You know what I'm saying? And, and inevitably, every time, it's especially time for the presidential election, the people be mad at me. Right. Like all the people who were with the chucks and the pearls, I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. Like, I don't, <laughs> I ain't got it. Right. So I just, I tried to just like, I don't want to steal anybody's moment. If you feel like this, this is what you were waiting for and you know, Kamala represents some hope for you, then I feel like you go girl, but it's not, I don't take any personal pride um, in, in Kamala Harris. Right, right. I get it. I get it 100%. I get it. As again, like we said before, yeah, I don't know that person, you know, so, you know, but again, all skin ain't kin, right? And we've seen it, you know, and we'll continue to see it. And who's really about, you know, the root of the problem, trying to fix the problem, you know, trying to get dirty with, you know, for real, for real, as we say, you know, around the way. Um, table of contents. Now, you know, I'm a hip hop person. Clearly, you are a hip hop person. And we had a little, a little, little bit. It's just a little, yeah, a little bit. Had a little conversation beforehand. I'm looking at the titles of some of these things. And, and for such a young, young, young lady, you're listening, looking at some of these titles here. I'm like, all right, was this around your time when you were there? Listen, now I feel like you're trying to play my face. Oh, no. I, I feel like you're trying to play my face, and I think you shouldn't disrespect me like that. With all due respect, I apologize. Let's not, let's, let's not do said, that. It's the wisdom. It's the wisdom. It's the wisdom. But I, I am grown. So if somebody, the, the first hip hop song I remember like coming home to watch the video and record it on the VCR was probably Buddy. Okay. Right. Okay. So, and I like, yes, uh, that was my sort of era around 89, right? Okay. I was 11 years old. Like this is when I really started okay. getting into it. Okay. Um, but 89 was a big year, right? Absolutely. So fight the power, right? 1989, Absolutely. the number of another summer, like so many things were happening and I was already somebody, even as a child, who was interested in politics. Mm. So I was watching sort of these things. I remember watching the Fight the Power um, video. I remember hearing about um, Crown Heights and this person being um, sort of pursued. He's running from some white mob on, on a beach um, in New York and, and, and the Jewish man hitting the black guy, you know, in, like these are the things I used to hear on the news and I was very interested. Um, in the backstories of, and so that's what helped connect me to hip hop as a child. Right, right. 
that's an awesome and a beautiful thing because I, I didn't think of it that way because I came up maybe 10 or 12 years before that when it was, you know, Grandmaster Flash and Sugar Hill Gang and all them. And they weren't talking about that. They were talking about parties and stuff like that. And so I came through all that. But by the time I got to, you know, college around that time, the same time you started seeing the buddy and everything, it was like, okay, I began to, some of these books right here, you see behind me, Hakeem's Bookstore. Because I wasn't getting into school. And even HBC that I went to, shout out to McChain University. But at that time, we didn't have a course or a major in African studies. Most of those African studies programs were at like the PWIs. The temples and so on and so forth. That's a whole nother conversation for another time, I guess, or whatever, too, right? But that's just keeping it real. So, shout out to Brother Dawood Hakeem, you know, Cheney Lum, who had his bookstore in Atlanta and also 52nd Street. I got most of these books from there and began to gain the knowledge of self by reading those books. So, here, chapter one Fear of a Black Planet, mm -hmm. Racial School Reform, 1967 through 71. It's, it's kind of self-explanatory, but you want to dig into that a little bit? What made you sure. Know? So that era, 1967, begins what I see as the modern school reform era in Philadelphia, but also two, two things happened very interesting. Philly got a new superintendent of schools, Mark Shedd, who was, I think, 41 years old at the time. And so as somebody who will be 44 in 10 days, it always kind of blows me away that you have mm. this, this young person um, who is super, who, you know, the young white guy who they brought in to be superintendent of schools. But also that's the year that Frank Rizzo became the police commissioner in Philadelphia. They were hired at the same time and, and they thought they were polar opposites. The press tried to present them as polar opposites. But what I argue in there is that they were actually two sides of the same coin. Mm. Um, going back to this idea of with Democrats like these who needs Republicans, all this talk around, you know, liberals and these liberal ideals. It all, it, it, you know, I, I, I realize there are people who think they are doing the, the right thing, right? But I think about Dr. King and how he was talking to the white moderate, right? This sort of slow moving, you know, those who say, you know, not so fast or, and he would say, how long are we supposed to wait? Um, he, Shed reminded me of the white moderate. He came in, um, in some ways, very ignorant of what the Philadelphia context, right? Of how, and he had a lot of energy and he had a lot of um, commitment in his mind to Black people. Okay. But your commitment is revealed when somebody holds your feet to the fire. And so when his feet started being held to the fire, then what you see play out is his, this sort of, this all this stuff around what he calls equality, equality. Well, if you're saying everything has to be equal, but the person who I'm supposed to be equal to has always had a lead over me, how equal is that? Mm -hmm. Right? And so what we end up seeing is shed and at least what I hope we end up seeing, what I argue is that Shed and Rizzo were actually two sides of the same coin. Rizzo was more vocal about it, although when well, you in the second chapter starts to talk about how when people would call Rizzo out, then Rizzo was like, let me let me go ahead and be mean to white people too, so they stop saying um, I'm a racist. Oh, Rizzo. Um, but Shed, you know, he he wanted to quell people's fears that he wasn't giving too much power to black people. Mm. And so that's where this fear of a black planet came from, or fear of a black district. Okay, okay. Which then takes us into chapter two. You call it thug life, <laughs> Frank Rizzo's law and disorder. I see Frank Rizzo as the ultimate thug. You know, um, the first time I heard about Frank Rizzo, maybe not heard about, I remember hearing about him because I probably heard about him beforehand, was when I was 13 years old in the summer of 1991 when I was getting ready to start high school, but I was home one day watching all my children and they broke through to say that he had died. Mm. He was running for mayor for like the 13th or 14th time or something. I don't know, right. he had run so many times. Right. Um, and I remember being annoyed, like, why is he on my TV? What are you doing? What, you know, what is happening here? And um, I talked to my parents about like, you know, him because I was interested in politics. And they told me my grandfather, my grandfather died when I was three years old, but my grandfather was a Rizzo supporter. Hmm. That was his homie. Um, but my grandfather also had had some vices that, and it doesn't surprise me that he aligned himself 
with this, uh, this brute of a man. Um, I call it law and disorder because he claimed to be the law and order. He ran on this like law and order ideal, right, right, right? right? But it was just disorder and dysfunction. He's a whole yeah. mess. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a whole other conversation also just to talk about him alone. Mm -hmm. um, Black Rain, Queen Latina. And first of now all- that those, one I think is self-explanatory. Yeah, 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 yeah. First of all, the artist, Public Enemy, Tupac, Black Rain, that would be Queen Latifah. Queen Latifah. Absolutely. My favorite uh, female MC. Yeah. The Constant Clayton era. Talk I about started to call it. I started to call it Ladies First. Okay. Right? Okay. Because you got the Queen Latifah and Moni Love song. Um, and, you know, there were definitely, there was an effort. There was, she made a concerted effort to uplift Black women in the district um, at that time. Um, I think after that, she started to pay some attention to uplifting Black men as well. Um, and there were those who I interviewed, some elders who I interviewed who were like, that's when they felt like people started coming for her more. When she mm -hmm. was trying to incorporate um, Black men in the uplift, wow. that's when they made her tenure untenable. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Black Reign, because she was the first Black um, superintendent of the district. Um, and first black woman. So shout out to Queen Latifah. Yeah. And you know, when I read that too, and I had to go, because I just talked about uh, Fannie Coppin a while back, right? And so Fannie Coppin, but I guess it wasn't the school district of Philadelphia at the time. It was just, I, she became a, maybe a superintendent somewhere else. But she's a principal here. I see, you know, Institute of Color Youth, you know, Shane University and whatnot. So I said, well, yeah, it's Connie Clayton, actually. I thought it was Fannie Coppin, but that was a different time, way, way, way before that, I guess, or whatever. Um, Ready to Die, Last Rice for Philly Schools. Talk about that. You know, those years are interesting. Biggie Smalls, shout out Biggie Smalls. Biggie Smalls, shout out Biggie Smalls. Absolutely shout out to Biggie Smalls. Ready to Die came out in the fall. I'm, I'm looking at the album cover right here. Um, mm. Came out in the fall of 94, right when that chapter starts, the tenure of David Hornbeck. The reason why I wasn't sure what I was going to call the chapter, but I called it Ready to Die because there is a line, and I, I actually opened the chapter with this. When you have the book, you'll see it, where David Hornbeck says in the minutes, July 1, 1998 is the day the school district of Philadelphia will cease to exist in any recognizable form. That's verbatim. Mm. That's in the minutes. That's not, that's not me trying to... <laughs> surmise something that's what he said and so what happens in that era is the um the board members they start they they do all this sort of if we don't do this the district is going to die everything they're saying if we don't get the money if we don't if we don't uh, make concessions with the union if we don't do this if we don't do this the district is going to die the district is going to die one of the board member members mentions bob dole Bob Dole, I, I was in the Senate then. I want to say he may have been um, the Senate leader. But yeah, she refers to him and says, you know, Bob Dole was sort of kicking, um, uh, kicking teachers unions. And excuse me, she was talking about how she didn't support that. But if they didn't do something different, the district was going to die. Um, also in 1994. So the fall, I paid very little attention to the superintendent's uh, when I was a senior in high school, which is when, in 94, when he started. Um, I paid more attention prior to that because Constance Clayton was a household name. Absolutely. And it was, you know, it was a big deal that she, but this white man with this thick mustache who came in, you know, most of us, I was kind of like, listen, I'm going to graduate. Like, this is not, this is not my business as long as they don't get in the way of me graduating. But in the fall of 94, I was taking a social science class and we had to write a paper. And I will never forget that I did my little paper on the quote unquote Republican revolution of 1994. It was the midterm elections, two years after Clinton had won. Clinton was supposed to, he was, they were trying to paint him as this staunch liberal, even though the record will show that Clinton had these terrible policies um, around like sort of throwing women and children off um, 
you know, support and, and they, oh, now you have to go to work and you have to prove this, that, and the other, right? And so he was trying to out Republican Republicans, but but as continues to happen, because the Democrats always do this, you try to out Republican Republicans and then they just come out and be even worse. And so there was this Republican revolution of 94. And so there was this, um, I want to say that's also when a homeboy, um, Tom Ridge gets elected to be the governor of Pennsylvania. Wow. Right. Yeah, you know, yeah. Go ahead. Right. So who ends up being the, you know, the czar, the, the homeland security czar or something under Bush in 2001. Um, so ready to die just felt like the time when whatever progress had been made under Constance Clayton, the district was ready to to kill itself. Um, that was the stance it was taking. If you don't do these things, either we are going to kill the district itself or it's just not going to exist. And they didn't name who was going to come in and sort of do it. But, you know, at the end of that era, that's when the legislation was written for the state to take over the yeah. school district of Philadelphia. Because it seemed like to me, because I was probably just starting, I was in graduate school, starting to teach at that time, right around 94, and I got my first master's. And it seemed like, you know, Hornbeck was okay i mean from a distance or whatever he was trying to be okay right Absolutely. I I, you know and but then he was like he was in and he was out he was gone right you know it seemed like they well, just, he was there for six years yeah yeah but it didn't seem like anybody supported him right it seemed like he had well, no they ideas. didn't everybody was mad at hornbeck when when right. he came they they were mad at hornbeck from the door right and the thing is that um from my perspective it was hard to see when people weren't mad at Hornbeck. Right. So initially, Hornbeck was seen as this, you know, it was, it, I think many Black Philadelphians saw Hornbeck coming in as sort of a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. You just had 11 years of Constance Clayton, the first Black sure. woman, and now you're going to give the district to this white man. And there mm -hmm. had been a Black guy, I, forget, I think his name was Walton, who um, the AFL um, CIO supported um the african-american change of commerce supported but and and but rendell wanted uh hornbeck okay and so it went to hornbeck and mm -hmm. so one of my narrators one of my witnesses one of my white witnesses i remember her telling me like you know the 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 people on the board who were from northeast philly you know these white folks who would claim that northeast philly wouldn't get their fair share with Constance Clayton at the helm. When Hornbeck comes in, they're like, yes, right? Oh, okay. But Hornbeck comes in and Hornbeck was like, oh, I'm not here for y'all, right? Right. And then, and, and so then they hated, they hated right. Hornbeck. Right. But the PFT also hated Hornbeck right. because prior to Hornbeck coming, he had been um, part of problematic ed policies in the state of Maryland, one which I had to live through, and then in the state of Kentucky. So he had a national reputation for, for like supporting things like merit pay um, and this idea of, of you know, firing, I, I shouldn't say firing, um, but, but being the teacher accountability, okay. which was fairly new um, in the early 90s. Wow. So the next one, it, it still breaks my heart when I think about what happened to my shout out to all fellow, you know, uh, alum of Barsham High School, you know, Graves, you know. Um, but yeah, when the next person came in, and it's called Things Fall Apart, mm -hmm. the Paul Ballas Project. I was there, you know, shout out to, you know, your soror who was there. I'm coaching football as a head coach, and she's coaching, you know, cheerleading as a head cheerleading coach, and whatnot, and we're rocking and rolling and whatnot, you know, got this, you know, massive school to deal with, you know, kids from, you know, all different, you know, backgrounds and levels and so on and so forth. Then all of a sudden, okay, now we're just going to take this school and break it up into five different schools. And you just got to deal with this population of students here. After forever, it had been this one thing. And I didn't see this happen in the Northeast schools, but I saw it happen in schools where it was predominantly students of color. So yeah, things fall apart. You know, I, def I hated it. It broke my heart when that happened. Um, but I can definitely, that resonates with me. Things fall apart. Talk about that a little bit. So, I mean, shout out to the Roots for their album, Things absolutely. Fall Apart. Absolutely. Roots. Roots crew. Absolutely. However, um, this title goes back to the Chen Wai Chebi uh, novel, Things Fall Apart. Okay. And the okay. novel opens up 
with um, a line from the William Butler Yeats poem. Um, it says something like, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mm -hmm. um, the best or the, the worst, or, or, you know, the worst, basically the worst people, they're getting things done and the best people, you know, are sort of out of here. Okay. Um, I called it things fall apart because Vallis comes in and he's supposed to be, you know, everybody's like, oh my God, he, they call him a miracle worker. He's amazing. It was smoke and mirrors. Yeah, sure. It was all smoke and mirrors. It was, it was a house of cards. It mm -hmm. was, you know, it, <laughs> and um, you, your experience at Bartram, it doesn't surprise me um, because Vallis, I mean, he was a PR person. He knew all he had to do was put the right spin on it. Um, and I'm not going to say Vallis didn't do anything because, because most people who worked with him actually didn't question his ethics, which I think was interesting. He did things that were, um, maybe outside the bounds of how they were supposed to operate, but people would always argue like, you know, even though this money was allotted for discipline, he used this money to get resources to schools and maybe he didn't use it in the right way, but it's not like he put it in his pocket. The money went you know, toward discipline. Right. Although I think if you start to pull that back, you know, then you can ask, well, who gets the contract to handle the discipline, you know? Um, so what does it mean that it, it went toward discipline? Around the end of his tenure, you know, there was allegedly a budget surplus and then it was, oh no, there's a deficit of 2 million, no, it's 6 million, no, it's 7 million, no, it's 13 million, no, it's 20 million. And yeah. surprise, I'm out, you know? Right. Um, and so that's essentially why I called it things fall apart, right? So this, this image he has set up, um, he couldn't maintain it. And then the other side of that is that partial way into his tenure in Philadelphia, you find out that the Chicago miracle was a bunch of hogwash and malarkey, Yeah. right? That it was some foolishness. Yeah. I mean, definitely for me, you, you know, and some money did flow because as a coach, you know, because once he broke schools up, he then began to like put more money in. So I was able to get some money for like a just much smaller team, much smaller program or whatnot, you know, so, but just the fact that it also hurt neighborhoods, in my humble opinion, because the neighborhood traditions are the things that made me want to get into education and coaching in the first place. Now kids are starting to go all over the place and whatnot. When, you know, we coming from Southwest, and I'm not saying kids shouldn't have had the opportunity to go other places if they wanted to, but for those kids who going to be in that traditional neighborhood situation, they had pride because their parents had pride there as well. Like that killed Southwest Philadelphia. And now it's looked at as this, this other thing. And then also invited the opportunities for the charters. And it's not anti-charter. There are some good charter organizations out there. I'm not going to get into that part, but it definitely elevated that. Right? It took away what was there and elevated something else because this was supposedly so bad, but it wasn't. If you look at the data, and you can pull it up, look at the data at the time when he came in and broke us apart. It wasn't bad. It was, what was it called? Safe Harbor, right? It was, it was Safe Harbor. So based on that, you know, that criteria, we were right there, Safe Harbor, right close to AYP. But then when you break us apart, now it goes all the way down to suit. You know, so yeah, things definitely fell, fell apart at that particular school. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it breaks my heart whenever I think about that. Um, Black on both sides, most deaf, right? Yes? It is most deaf. It is most my deaf. favorite hip hop album of all time. Umi says, yes, Umi yes. says. Shine your light on the world. Absolutely, absolutely. I want my people to be free. Absolutely. Perils of neoliberalism. Yeah. Talk, about, talk about that, because I just looked no. through that as an administrator, so. Black on talk. both sides um, looks at the last two black superintendents there were. So Arlene Ackerman and Bill Hype. Um, which I, you know, when we were talking before the session started, we were talking about all kin folk, you know, all skin folk and kin folk. And <clears throat> so I think that's part of it, but I also think it's more complicated than that. Um, family is complicated. And I, my first interaction with Arlene Ackerman, Arlene Ackerman came to Philadelphia in the summer of 2008. So I had just started this research a few months before she came. She came over to Temple to speak. 
And I didn't go to her talk because, you know, I was over, I was kind of like, don't nobody want to hear, you know, yet another, you know, talk ahead. But I was a doctoral student, right? And I had no money. So they had a reception. So I went down to the reception because I wanted the snacks. So I walk in the room and she was talking to somebody and she stops talking and starts looking at me. So, but she, she's looking at me like, you know, like one of your aunties, right? So I'm like, is something wrong with my clothes? Like what's happening? And so I go say, you know, hello, um, welcome to Philadelphia. And she was like, you weren't at my talk. And I said, no, ma'am, I, I was not. I was, I was here working. I'm a doctoral student. I was here working. I came for the snacks and to say hello. And she was like, if you were at my talk, I would remember you. And I was like, okay. So she said, you're a doctoral student. You know, what are you doing? Do you want to be a superintendent? And I was like, no, ma'am, not at all. And she starts laughing. So she's like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, I don't know. I, I'm getting this doctorate. We're going to see. I don't know. Maybe I'll be a professor or something. She said, you should come shadow me. And so she let me come shadow her one day. My, in my interactions with her, she was the warmest um, and most personable. Now, that was in my interactions with her. In my observations of her, I was like, what is that? What is, what is this? What are we doing? What? So I was in a meeting and she was having a meeting with parent. I can't, it wasn't a parent group, it was a teacher group. Some teachers had come down to, the, to 440 and I was sitting in the back of the room observing and she had an assistant. I forget the woman's name, um, little Asian woman. I think her name was Jenny, used to be her assistant. And so Jenny comes and tells her, um, Matthew Costanzo is out front and he wants to speak to you. And so I know who that is automatically, right? Matthew Costanzo was a former superintendent of the district. Okay. She didn't know who she, so she's like, well, who is that? And so her assistant tells her, it used to be the superintendent of this district. And so Dr. Ackerman responds, well, what does he want? Now, as somebody who values elders, I also know I, 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 the line of questioning was hard for me, right? Because I'm sitting there like, there's not a whole lot of people on the planet who've done this job. You are an outsider. If that, if that old white man has stumbled upon 440 and he just wants to say hello, whatever, to me, because he sat in a seat that you're sitting in now and you know very little, you want this to work, to me, you give him five minutes, two minutes, whatever it is. Thanks. I think that's what you do with elders. I don't know what went on through her mind, but she was essentially like, well, get his card. And, you know, I'll give him a call later. And to me, it was very dismissive. And who knows? It could be, you know, that, that it could be. I'm not going because I actually saw her give Sonny Hill a whole lot of time that day I was there. OK, a lot of time that he was trying to do some programs and she met with him. At what felt to me like in sincerity and earnest. And so I was I, for me, it was disconcerting that she wouldn't do this for somebody who had sat in her seat. Cause I felt like she could learn something from him. Um, and then I also would hear her on the radio in the summer of 2009, bashing the PFT and telling them that they, need, they needed to accept the concessions she was trying to make. And I'm listening like, damn this, like, you know, you can't really, you gonna go on the radio and try to bully these people. Like that's not really, why would you want to carry it that way? You know, um, it felt like a bull in a china shop. It didn't, it felt like too much to me. Um, so this is what I mean by complicated, right? I felt, I felt, I felt like she had, she was interested in what I was doing. She gave me access. She wanted to give me an opportunity. She saw something in me. And then I saw her, you know, in these other ways where I was like, ooh, I don't, mm, this, this is not, I don't feel like this is going to end well. You know, and it didn't. Um, Ackerman is one of those complicated people who I feel like love black people, but it, perhaps a certain type of black people. You know, it's funny you say that because I do know that at that time, or just before she got there, but then when she got there, there was um, a heavy push 
for Africana studies, African American studies and textbooks and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, and I never heard her say this, but I heard through, 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 through you know, whisper down the ladies of the grapevine that she wasn't really heavy into that. And I was like, how could she not be into supporting something that represents us as far as that curriculum? Um, is any of research? See, that's anything? a conversation I feel like we need to have off the uh off Okay. The- and that's fine. And that's fine. I'll- but but the how can she is not there's plenty of people, you know what I mean? It depends on. You know, one time I was talking to um, a woman, a black woman, who said something to me about like we're both women of color, and it it was kind of baffling to me because I was like, "What color, sis? Like I don't identify as a woman of color. I am a black woman. I usually joke and tell people you can't get blacker than when your mother names you Kamika. I like there's no." <laughs> I don't, I don't know about color. I don't know what that means. I don't know about trying to make, you know, my, my blackness palatable for somebody. But there are people who um, have adopted um, maybe more, they, they've tried to take on things that will make it easier to live out. I'll say it like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. So rest in peace, Dr. Akin, first and foremost. Let's get right Absolutely. You know. And that definitely say that for her. Um, I did have an opportunity to meet her. She was superintendent at the same time I became uh, an assistant principal of climate and culture at Simon School. And so that would have been around 2010. So she was still uh, active at that time, I guess, or whatever. So I got a chance to meet her. You know, I'll just leave it at that. Um, so then a couple of years later, we then get the one that's exiting uh, coming up soon. And talk about that a little bit, if you like. Oh, if you, if you like. If you like, and if not, that's okay. We can go right back. What should you say about Dr. Height? You know what I mean? I don't know. I I saw I spent like five minutes with Dr. Height one time 10 years ago when he first got to Philly. Um for me, he's very much been a politician. Facts. I, you know, I, I'll give him flowers for one thing. Something I wasn't even looking for. I wasn't even looking for it. But when I was asked to come back to try to support mama mater because they had fallen on hard times and mm-hmm. turned it and turned it around from a climate perspective they reached out to me you know through one of his assistants i will not say that person's name um but um you know he was at the helm when i got that opportunity and it was one of the best you know three years of my life to do to have that experience period you know engage, engage with the community and engage with the babies and turn it around from a climate perspective so for that you know i thank him for that but that's, that's all I'll say as far as that goes. Um, when I think of Dr. Height, I think of the school closings of 2013. Yeah. And, and he wasn't solely responsible for that. You know what I mean? There Parts of that were already in motion when, um, when he came on. Um, oh, yeah. I do feel like the School Reform Commission deliberately chose two Black Philadelphia outsiders to give the veneer of representation. Mm-hmm while using them to gut the entire school district of Philadelphia. Yeah, and, and the thing of it is, if you look at like, I did a little bit of research also, I guess, on, on and I won't go too, too far into it because that's not what this is about, but like the, the Broad Foundation and kind of like what they do around the country and whatnot, you know, mm-hmm. that could be another conversation offline. That's not what, you know what I mean? But uh, they both came from that as well, right? To my mm-hmm. understanding. So. Yeah. That's a whole nother conversation as well. So 2016, let's get back to you. 2016, 2016, when you testified before city council on the significance of black educators for the school district of Philadelphia and why it was essential to retain black educators, not just recruit them. Were you optimistic that things would change? Why or why not? Unfortunately, I'm rarely optimistic. I like I, I'm just being honest with you. I am rarely optimistic, um, but I feel like you know the work is the work, right? Like whether or not I believe people are going to act right has nothing to do with whether or not I say something. Um, I was invited to speak about what why I think the district has doesn't have you know as many black educators as they used to have, and my suggestion was that they put more time and energy into retaining the people they do have. 
than they do into creating a churn. Um, and I stand by that. But in order to do that, there would have to be stability at so many levels, you know? And right now you have this mass exodus of teachers, period, mm -hmm. you know? Black, and white, brown, whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And the, the truth is I can't blame them. As somebody who prepares prospective teachers, it's getting harder and harder and harder to tell these young people that this is where they, you know, should plan to spend their lives. Yeah, it used to be a noble thing. Is I, I still, you know, we're it's not that I think it's not noble, right? I I still think it's noble, but you know, Toyota, you can't pay Toyota in nobility, right? You right. know, like they're like, okay, that's cool, it's noble. Where's the where's the car note? Where's the check? Um, and, I, and so beyond being underfunded or teachers not making enough, now you have, you know, all this crazy legislation. You got the CRT legislation. You got the don't say gay legislation. You got people wanting to check out your classroom library. Um, it's, it's just so much. And because we live, you know, in a social media context, we are inundated with, and, and not, I think we need to know what's happening, but who wants to live with that level? Who wants to go to school for all these years to be more in debt than what you're going to make and then live with this scrutiny right. of people who couldn't survive a day doing the right. job you do? Right. I get it. I guess I'm blessed that I started many, many years ago. So I'm at the back end of that, right? So I don't, but I understand, but I empathize. I see it. And so when I had taught the educators and, and the ones that I kind of work with right now, whatever, um, and they tell me some of these same things you're saying, you know, what's next, what's next, you know, I don't know, I'm getting burned out, you know, yada, yada, yada. It's just, it's some everywhere. It's just some everywhere. And it's, um, it's unfortunate. But somebody's going to educate the babies. And this next thing I'm going to talk about is COVID, right? So one thing, and it's not a conversation about COVID, but COVID taught us a whole lot, you know, and also exposed a lot of different things, um, but also provide opportunities for education, to operate a different kind of way. It's almost like they knew that something was gonna be happening, they, whoever they are, to make uh, education different with this mass exodus of teachers. Because if I can just have a couple of buildings and, never, and people on computers and people Zooming at home or you know, teaming at home and so on and so forth, that's gonna become like the new normal. This has been, in my humble opinion, part of the plan for some people, but you still have the friend schools that exist, mm -hmm. right? And so you're going to have this that top 10% or 5% or whatever is still going to be able to go to the Harvards and the Yales and so on and so forth and everyone else. But, you, you know, so that's a whole, these are all my opinions. Again, this is not your book per se, but, you know, so COVID has exacerbated many issues, you know, for schools that are already struggling in urban settings, right? And then it yeah. points that out. You know, in your opinion, what are some of the major problems and what can the schools do to overcome them? Because it's almost like it's by design. COVID wasn't by design. COVID wasn't, or, or I don't know depending on what you believe, um, or the perception of it. Um, but byproduct of what has happened as a result of COVID has definitely impacted urban education immensely. What can we do, in your opinion, to overcome some of that? I, uh, to overcome it? I don't know. Like, I can't, it, it, it's hard for me as somebody who's not in a K-12 building um, every day to tell people what I think they should do in K-12 buildings every day, especially okay. in a context, right? Like even when I'm teaching my teachers, I try to remind them, I left the seventh grade classroom literally 20 years ago. So I didn't have to contend with cell phones and I didn't have to deal with social media. So I can't, all I can tell you to suggest to you about cell phones and social media is things that I've read. You want to try it out for yourself. I, I can't suggest anything with those because I haven't had to, I didn't have to deal with those. With COVID, um, I think about, so I'm back on campus this year. I stayed mm -hmm. home the entire year last year because I was like, these kids is not finna kill me. And I also helped to care for uh, my, my, you know, my mother's 74, my father's 81, my grandmother's 97. And I, I could not rest in my mind that I could get sick at work and then go, you know, hurt one of my parents or my grandparents. What, what drives me crazy about what's happening in our schools, K-12, is they were already set up in ways that, that were dehumanizing, that did not encourage life, 
that didn't encourage health, right? You stuck in all these kids in these classrooms. Um, so for one thing unions have been asking for for years is smaller class size. Mm -hmm. It makes perfect sense, especially, and when you start talking about, you know, kids are quote unquote behind, which I, I can't stand this narrative of behind because I'm always like, what exactly behind who? What exactly does that mean, right? We don't all move at the same pace and then the same, it's not, that learning is not linear, right? But okay, behind. Why wouldn't you make those classes smaller? Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you double the number of teachers in schools where kids are so-called so behind, right? Why wouldn't we set up some other learning environment so people aren't on top of each other? Except that, I have a potty mouth, um, Damon. I'm really sort of holding myself back from, from some of the, 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 the cuss words that just want to come out my mouth because I'm just like, I, to me, none of this was ever set up. They don't ever set it up for our young people to be well, to be healthy, mm -hmm. to be whole, for our teachers really to be able to deal with them. The more, the more um, living in poverty people are doing, the more sort of issues people are having in terms of their context, the more they need a relationship, a meaningful relationship with their teacher, which means when you have 40 kids and one teacher, that relationship is going to suffer. So then you put something like COVID on top of that, where now literally we run our risk higher with the more people who are in the room. Add to that, that it's Black people who have gotten sick most often, who've been sick longer, who've been so sick that we have to be in the hospital. We're the ones who have disproportionately had to deal with that too. I, 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 I don't know what to say, except it is extremely um, and continues to be extremely difficult um, to be black at every turn in this country. Um, it was that way before COVID and, and COVID just, I feel like made that clearer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I worry about our schools not having ventilation. I had a student in the fall who, it, who graduated from Masterman. Mm -hmm. And I used to tease him because on the news in the fall was about the asbestos and Masterman. Right. And I would say, well, Jesus, if they can't get the asbestos out of Masterman, what are they doing at Brunton? Right. <laughs> right? Like, if, if they don't give a damn about kids at Masterman, the rest of the district has very little, like, we should all be extremely scared of what's going on in the rest of these buildings. So I don't know what to say um, about COVID besides, you know, I, I my hope would be people are finding creative ways to um, lessen class size, to increase the distancing, to increase the ventilation, um, those types of things. Part of, as somebody who's on campus now, part of what makes me safe as an educator is that I don't ever have students that close to me, quite honestly. Yeah. And now we're mask optional. And I'm like, you take it off if you want to. Don't bring your cooties over here. Mm -mm, we're, not meeting in, we're not meeting in my office. We can meet on the Zoom. I'll sit in this room with you and we can talk, but you want to give me five feet, bro. You cannot come this close to me. Right. Hey, listen, there was a question in here. Do you feel like I answered the question? I don't know if you can see the chat room or not. Did you uh, check sure. that out? That's my my old friend, Aisha Anderson. Yeah, oh. what, shout out to Aisha. She's TJ Barsham, as a matter of fact. Oh, wow. Aisha and I started teaching together in Baltimore in 1989. Okay. okay. So I see her question. Do I think Ackerman didn't listen to the people before her because she thought she knew better than folks here? Unfortunately, so the short answer is yes. I do think she thought she knew better. I also think people tend to think that they know Philly. Like if they've run other districts, you know, Phil, oh, Philly's going to be a cakewalk. Baby, you ain't never seen nothing. Listen. Every listen. time somebody in the media does something crazy, I'd be like, you know where they're from, right? So we ain't going to talk about your homie last Sunday, right, who walked up with the smack. But then when Dawn Staley and her team just did the thing, I was like, y'all know where she from, though, right? Like... <laughs> complications and contradictions that that is the that is the, the city of philadelphia and its surrounding areas there's i feel i've been to a lot of places there's nowhere in the world like it and i think for people to come in and to assume ackerman had been superintendent of schools in dc and san francisco and i think she 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 saw she was retired 
she would tell people, I came out of retirement to do this, you know? And it was like, sis, but you don't know this. You don't know this place. Right. Oh, no, right. you don't know what you're getting yourself into. Right. Um, and there's a hubris that usually comes. You know, when, when they were doing this search, somebody called me and asked me if I would consider throwing my hat in the ring for superintendent. And before you say what you're going to say, I was just thinking, when you said it earlier, I know you have no desire, but you could do it. I, I, I told her, you could do it. my blood pressure is 122 over 74, and I'm not on medication. And I intend to stay that way. I intend to live a long, healthy life, and these folks are not going to run up my blood pressure. I feel I mean, that. There has to be a certain hubris right. um, to come in feeling like all these other people have had a hard time, but you're going to be the one that's going to, you know, sort of turn this thing around. And somebody asked me about the new superintendent. You know, what do I think? And do I think that he's going to make a big difference? And I'm like, I just want him not to make it worse. Mm. Just don't, you know, don't, don't, don't sell off no more buildings. Don't come in here doing the slash and burn. Like, just well, don't make it, <laughs> don't make it no. Unfortunately, 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 you know, gentrification is real, you know, and, and that's going to be part of the plan. I mean, there was an article that came out a few years ago and I guess maybe COVID may have stopped it a little bit, right? But it, it was like different phases, level one, two, and three. And so there's a group of schools within the next year or so, they're going to be sold off. It's going to happen because- the But numbers, here's the problem with selling them off, right? Because the building, I went and got my working papers when I was a high school student, right? Mm -hmm. Get working papers. Because I, I worked at the Chick-fil-A in the gallery. Um, I went and got my working papers at 13th and Spring Garden from it, it, when I went there in the 90s, it was an administration building. Well, come to find out as I was doing this research, it had been a school. So I get that we have population shifts and sometimes our needs change. The problem with that spate of, of sellings though, that um, ne Neville's from the SRC mm -hmm. that he initiated is that the, we didn't make, the district didn't make the money off it. Right, right. You made bad deals, you are supposed to be in business. I'm not in a school of business. I'm not a business person. I know you're supposed to make some money when you sell to school, right? And when you're not making money, then what exactly are you doing? Yeah. I mean, I just know for a fact, because I wouldn't even get into the details of it, but I know for a fact of getting a phone call some years ago from a business person who wanted to do a walkthrough of the school that I was leading because they wanted to turn it into a nursing home, right? And, and, and that could very well happen because other things have happened to other places and so on and so forth. So that's just a real thing. And I think ultimately it's, it's that's part of the plan. Yeah. That's just part of the plan, unfortunately. You know, hopefully, hopefully whatever plan is, it doesn't continue to hurt the kids even further. But ultimately, unfortunately, it probably will, you know? Yeah. So rounding off, I'm going to go to your last paragraph of the introduction. Like I said, this introduction is fire. Those out there in the world listening to this, you need to get this book. I am so excited and waiting for this whole book to come out. But I'm going to read the, the, the last paragraph of the introduction. It says, I hope this book honors Black fully educators inside the system and on the margins, ancestors, elders, and contemporaries who fought and fight for public schooling to meet Black children at their highest aspirations who worked and are working to disrupt and dismantle white supremacy perpetuated throughout the school systems and classrooms and who dream of the kind of schooling that centers black strength, joy, possibility, and then who work to create just that. Talk about that last paragraph for a little bit. Um, I have been um, deeply, richly loved my entire life by some of the flyest, smartest, kindest Black people God ever made. Um, and they were Philly people, are Philly people. So um, I grew up in Penrose, but my parents were married at um, Enon, was now referred to as Old Enon mm -hmm. um, on Culture Street. I have this picture of my grandparents walking into the church for my parents' wedding ceremony. Um, and so my, my parents raised us, my sister and I, in that church. Um, even though we lived in Penrose, we would trek up to Germantown. Mm. Um, and not just once a week, because on Thursday nights, I, I would be there for choir rehearsal. And so I was on the usher board and, and you know all types of things. Um, because of growing up in that church, 
there were, and, and as somebody who's first generation college, there were things my parents didn't know. And these are the people who sort of stood in the gap for me. So one would be um, Ms. Jean Teagle, who was a teacher at Emlyn um, Elementary School. She was one of my elders um, at Enon. Um, one who I lost um, last August, Doris Shirley. Um, Ms. Shirley was a counselor. When I was in high school, Ms. Shirley was a counselor at Girls High. Mm -hmm. um, but prior to that, she worked at King. She worked at um, South Philly High School. Um, she had participated in the 1964 Voluntary Transfer Program. Um, Ms. Shirley read my college essays and gave me feedback, sitting in the pews you know, after service in church. That's not something she had to do. You know what I mean? She did that because, um, because she wanted to, because she was invested in me. Ms. Shirley helped me think through how to pick a high school. Um, Ms. Shirley set up for me to shadow her daughter one day at Girls High. Um, she, she met my mom at 30th Street Station when they put me on the train to go down and stay for the weekend with her daughter at Hampton. Um, and not just the ones who were educators. So I think of uh, one of my elders, Carter Missouri, um, who was also um, an Enon person, Francis Lysad. Um, these people just loved on me since I was a small child and there was nothing, whatever work I do, um, I, I hope it brings honor to them. I hope they're, I, you know, I see myself as the fruit of their labor. Um, Charles Shirley, Miss Shirley's husband, who's still very much alive. You, you probably know or knew Charles Shirley at some point. Um, he's a, used to be super active in New Omega. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, 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 okay. So Mr. Shirley and I share a birthday. Okay. Um, birthday in 10 days too. Um, but Mr. Shirley, yet another person deeply invested you know, and me and my sister and, and our success. So when I talk about my elders and my ancestors, um, these are the people who, you know, who I think like has my work um, honored them. I think of the people at North Carolina Central, two of my professors at NCCU um, loved me so much and were so invested that they flew up to Philadelphia for my dissertation defense. I remember you posted that. I remember you posted 12, that. 13 yeah. years after I defended. Um, Floyd Farabee, who was my English teacher, another Omega man, my English teacher, English professor at American Literature at North Carolina Central. Jarvis Hall, who was my political science professor um, at NCCU. It's Minnie Fort Brown and Joyce Ellis, who were my English professors who flew up. Um, again, these are my, my Black elders who you know, deeply invested um, themselves in me and in my success and gave me their time and their energy and their interest and I, I want my work to, honor, I want my voice, my work, I want it to honor them. I want them, even when we disagree, you know, I want them to know that they gave me the tools um, so that I could disagree, right? So that I could stand. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's beautiful. Very well said. I'm sure that, you know, the elders and the ancestors are smiling wherever they are, because you definitely are the fruit of their labor, for sure. You were definitely their fruit. Um, I'm going to show a copy of the book, the book cover, so everybody can see this awesome and amazing book. And I know it's not your first, you've done some other books, some other writings, but this is your first book of this nature. Yes. First book, yeah. So I have had like book chapters and things like that. Yeah, yeah stuff like that, right. It's my first book. Okay, let me just share this. So here it is, people. Talk about it a little bit. Talk about where to get it from and all that. It's all written right there for everybody to see. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, my dear friend, Mark Lamont Hill, his uh, bookstore is Uncle Bobby's up in Germantown. Um, Harriet's Bookshop is Black woman owned um, in Philadelphia. If you already pay for Amazon free shipping, you might want to go that direction. It's also available uh, for pre-order at 
Barnes and Noble and Harvard Ed Press is offering 20% off um, if you uh, order directly from them. So it is still available for pre-order. It is scheduled to arrive at the warehouse on April 13th. Most people don't know that, but that's the day that pre-orders are supposed to start shipping out. So I, I am very much looking forward to receiving my own copy in my hands. Um, but please go pick up uh, a copy, order, order you, pre-order you a copy. Absolutely. So when is there going to be your first like book signing event? I mean, have you started putting that on the calendar yet? I'm sure there's going to be a few of those. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm in the house. I'm in the house. Things in the works. We have some things in the works. So okay, okay. Yeah. All right, all right. Well, you come back and, and send me a blast, and I put that on my page and share that to the world because definitely this was awesome and amazing. Is there another question up here? Let me see. Is somebody asking? Yeah. Me? Aisha's asking if you can pre order. You can pre order online okay. from Uncle Bobby's. Yes. Okay. Oh, you can. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool, Absolutely. Cool, cool. Yeah. Oh, cool. All right. I, I, I'll go that way. I, I figured I'll come just straight to the, to the book signing, but I'll go do the pre-order things. It might take a little bit longer. They'll probably sell out with the pre-orders, I'm imagining. I, they're going to sell out anyway, so I'm going to have to get this second order. I, I, don't know. I don't know, but I'll take it. I know that's right. I know that's right. Listen, um, anything else that you want to share for the people? No, I just out? thank you for allowing me to be here to talk about my book. Um, you know, and I encourage us all to remember that um, all schooling is political. All schooling is political. There is no such thing as taking the politics out of school. Anybody who tells you they are trying to take the politics out of school is trying to sell you something. Mm, facts. So people, again, we have Dr. Kamika Royal in the house with the book. It's coming out very, very soon. You can get the pre-orders of Not Pay For Us, Black Educators, in public school reform in Philadelphia. This has been another, and don't go anywhere yet. This has been another episode of Peace. Please educate all children equally. I'll be with you in a couple of weeks. We have another guest. It's going to be awesome and amazing as well. But this here has been the dopest, dopest, dopest one of the year. I'm going to say that. I'm looking forward to that book. Looking forward to that, Mama. Uh, we appreciate you again. I appreciate you again. Awesome. All right. People, thank you for coming out. God bless you all and good night.